All right. So far, everything we've done, we've assumed that the reservoir was homogeneous and isotropic. In an effort to begin to think about heterogeneities, we're going to take a step back. If you recall, when we derived the pressure diffusivity equation in three dimensions, we arrived at a point where we had an equation like this, Technically, this would be in three dimensions, ignoring gravity. And then ultimately, we assume that you know if um, the material is isotropic, then K is, can be represented as just a scalar instead of a tensor. Uh, if it's homogeneous, then it's not a function of X. So then it can be moved outside the divergence sign. Uh, so again, for homogeneous isotropic, then that equation reduced to this one, which we've been using. Again, that's in 3D with, or 2 or 3D, uh, ignoring gravity. We're not, we're now going to remove the uh, homogeneous assumption and we're going to allow things to be spatial, spatially variable. So we're going to have to leave this uh, k over mu here under consideration uh, inside the divergence uh, operator there. And what we'll, we'll do is we'll go ahead and formulate the weak form of the equation just like we did before. So if you remember, uh, we moved sort of everything to one side of the equation. So. And then we multiply on the right by a function of x, a vector function of x in general, and then integrate over the domain of our porous media. So we're still going to work in one dimension, but we're going to add a little bit of complexity to our one dimension. So in other words, our pressures are only going to be uh, a function of x. But we're going to let our reservoir potentially have varying cross-sectional area. So at any point x, there's going to be constant cross-section right, so our reservoir will have a constant cross-section a of x but it's allowed to change as it goes along the x direction like that, okay? And so uh, with this, we can transform our integral into one over zero to L, and then an area integral over the domain, uh, over the constant cross section, A of x, and then I'll just go ahead and write everything else out. Now our function w uh, becomes a function of the scalar x. So here we have the differential over some dummy variable a prime and over x. And then in the second term, again, we have that. We'll go ahead, again, because our, we're, our, we're assuming that our cross-sectional area is constant, so we'll, we can go ahead and, and um, evaluate the inner integral. None of, our <clears throat> none of our functions are now, you know, w or p are not functions of, say, y or z because A is a, is, a, is a constant. So what we'll have then is just a A of X And now, since we're only 
you know, we've reduced the equation to one dimension, and I guess I could have written it this way up there. But now we just have partial partial x. We don't really need the gradient operator anymore. Again, just to be explicit, these guys are functions of x, as is the pressure and time. So we have that. Now we'll go ahead and <coughs> integrate this second term by parts. So we're going to integrate this guy by parts, and we'll keep these, these terms together here. So we have, we're almost running out of room, but we have, and all of that is equal to zero. Okay. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to let, just like before, we let w equal the Dirac delta function. This time, we're going to let w of x equal to 1. So w, if you recall, is an arbitrary function. And so we're going to assign it a value of 1. And then let's look at what happens here. I'm going to drop the function. The equations are just too long writing out all the functional dependencies. So re just remember that a is a function of x for now. phi and ct are constants. So we have that. And just like we did before, we're going to then, we, you know, phi is a continuous function, so we can then split the integral into segments, right? So we're going to do that. I'm going to say the sum over i from 0 to n minus 1 segments, where each segment is centered at a point xi minus delta xi over 2, and xi plus delta xi over 2. Again, writing everything out. All of that's equal to 0. <coughs> So now we're going to use midpoint quadrature to evaluate the integrals. So if you're not familiar or don't recall from sort of your numerical methods class, if you have an integral that goes from a to b, f of x dx, that's approximately equal to, and it's a very rough approximation, that guy. And so if we just apply that quadrature rule, the integrals then become Now, the second term still has some derivatives in it there. And let's look at what happened, you know, when we evaluate so we have p of x, right? And it's a continuous function. And what we did was uh, initially we split the integral into pieces. Right? Like so. And then uh, for any one of these chunks, when we evaluate the midpoint quadrature, say at a point xi, what we're doing is we're evaluating it as a rectangle, right? So this sliver. And of course, as we make these rectangles smaller, then we better approximate the integral. But right now, at any given point xi, which is in the center of this rectangle, you notice that the entire rectangle is constant there. There's no, uh, over, from the center of the grid block, there's no variation in the x direction from what's at the center. And there, so therefore, if I have the pressure at the center of this grid block after I've evaluated it via quadrature, th then the, the, this, is, this P of X here is a constant. Therefore, 
therefore the derivative with respect to x is zero. So that middle term goes away. And then we're just left with Um, if you recall, well, if you recall in a previous lecture, we defined uh, V of xi as equal to A of xi times delta xi, right? And so we're just saying that the volume is the cross-sectional area times delta xi, right? And so we'll go ahead and use that here. We'll say that the volume... And one last time, I'm just going to write this in an unevaluated form, and then we'll begin to evaluate this last term and see what happens. So we have that guy. And for reasons that will be should be made clear in a second, I'm going to divide this equation by a constant, B alpha. And of course, that represents the formation volume factor. Okay. So for the moment, and I, I know the purpose of all this was to introduce heterogeneity, but for the moment, let's see what happens if A, K, and mu are constants. So if I can pull them outside of this guy, uh, let's just see, um, see what we get. Again, we're going to pull out K, A, mu, and B alpha, leaving only the pressure gradient of X inside for this term to be evaluated. So if we then expand that evaluation, so let's look at on our one-dimensional line segment. If I have a point xi and a point xi plus 1, then the center point here likewise xi minus 1, then the center of these guys uh, for a constant delta x is, uh, so th you know, this point is delta xi plus delta xi over 2, right? And this is xi minus delta xi over 2, right? Or this is delta xi. And so, uh, if likewise we have a constant uh, delta xi here, and we'll relax that assumption later too, but if the points, uh, if the points in between them are just delta x for all cases, then we can actually just substitute our um, forward difference approximation or uh, central difference approximation. Um, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll substitute our forward difference approximation into uh, this der this derivative here in, in both cases and see what we get, right? So, again, we're evaluating in the midpoint. Remember I said that the pressures are constant within the grid blocks, but they can change from grid block to grid block. So you can have a pressure change at the intersection of two grid blocks because, uh, or where two grid blocks meet, because the pressure can change from one grid block to the next, right? 
or I'm using the word group block, but talking about line segments here. So uh, see what happens if we do that. I'm going to go ahead and I think by now you might recognize that this is what we called uh, before. This was a, the accumulation term, so B of XI. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just to prevent uh, having to write that over and over, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and write uh, B of XI. Don't be confused. Remember, B alpha is the formation volume factor. This is the accumulation term computed at the XI grid point, and it's and it has to be computed at the XI grid point every time for every XI because every XI could potentially have a, a different volume. Right? So we have that minus now I'm going to substitute in my difference approximations for these two derivatives. Both of them are going to have a delta x in the denominator, so I'm going to go ahead and pull that out here. Um, and then what we'd have is p xi plus 1 minus p xi minus it should be negative here minus p xi minus p xi minus 1 Okay, so then of course this simplifies, this term here you should see simplifies to P xi plus 1 minus 2 P xi plus P at xi minus 1. All right, so I'll write that on again on the next page in the simplified form, but I'm going to, just so you know, I'm going to distribute this minus sign. And I'm also going to label this as the transmissibility at xi, of course. Right. So just like before, we, we have the b at xi, the accumulation, and this we have the transmissibility. So I'll go ahead and write that on the next page, summarize it. It's a plus now because I've distributed, or I'm going to distribute the minus sign. Okay. So let's go ahead and write out a few terms of the of the series, right? So now we have this xi minus one thing again. We know that's sort of a fake bit, grid block that's going to go away when we apply the boundary conditions. So there's the first term plus and again we have this P at XN on the end which we know won't won't actually be there when we apply the boundary conditions. So let's let's look at a reservoir like we've looked at before. Let's say on the left end at x equals zero uh, has a constant pressure boundary condition, and on the right end uh, has a no flow boundary condition. So we know that uh, on the on the left, then where this uh, constant pressure boundary condition is, then we're going to average. Here's the x minus one. Here's the x0. We're going to average the pressures at the two to evaluate and set them equal to that there, which basically gives us p at 
uh, x minus 1 is equal to 2 pb uh, minus p at x0. Uh, this is just like before, and then we'll plug we'll plug this guy um, plug this equation back up in here, um, and of course then on the no flow side, on the no flow side we just have that p uh, at n this fake boundary condition is equal to um, p at n minus 1, right? Uh, and so we'll plug that in here. And ultimately then we get a system of equations, right? So if we write them in this way, And again, if we have this constant pressure boundary condition, then we have 3t0 minus t0, 0, and then every other row we have minus t1, 2t1 minus t1 minus t1. Two T one, I'm sorry, two two, two two minus two two, and so on. And all of that's now equal to a vector Q, where Q of course has this two T zero P B in the first entry due to due to the application of the boundary condition, right? So, um, again, we should all recognize that this is our matrix B from previous, and this is our matrix T from previous. So if this approach, which I haven't really given a name to, But this approach, which we'll call a um, finite volume approach, or sometimes I think Dr. Balhoff calls it a control volume. So in this control volume approach, for homogeneous conditions, we get the same matrix equations. And so, uh, namely, uh, rewriting their matrix form, we just have B, partial P, partial T, plus T, equal to Q. And so then if we do a forward difference in time uh, on our, on our uh, pressure here, and then depending on how we evaluate it for Explicit, we have so again for explicit methods, we're evaluating this P, evaluate P at time step N. Uh, then we're going to have this. And for implicit, we have so again, implicit is evaluate P at N plus one. That's that's this guy. Okay. T 
inverse. So this is the same equations we had before, just a different derivation. So you may wonder why we went through all the trouble. Well, again, um, this last part was just to show you that if we have a constant permeability, viscosity, and area, then we arrive at the same equations. But what we'll do now is we'll go back to right before we made those assumptions of constant area, permeability, et cetera, and we'll look at a way to introduce heterogeneity into these equations, and we'll look at the, the resulting equations that come out of that.